breakout session is titled Remote Tech in a Modern World, uh, which will be presented by Jacob Daniluk uh, from Tyline, which uh, we happen to know quite a bit about at, uh, at our plant. We use quite a bit of Tyline products. Uh, Jacob is the technical sales rep for Tyline's America's Market. He has 10 years of experience in the audio codec streaming world, during which he has provided solutions for broadcasters in small and large markets. His experience revolves around TCP IP unicasting, multicasting, and multi-unicasting. We're delighted to have Jacob here to share new technology for remote broadcasts. Please welcome Jacob Daniluk. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, yep. excellent. Wanted to make sure this thing worked. Um, so as uh, Burley said, I'm Jacob Daniluk. I work with Tyline. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about remote codecs and uh, remote technology that can be used out in the field. Now, first off, when I say remote, I'm not just referring to outside broadcasting. I'm referring to anything outside the studio. So whether that's your tower site uh, 50 miles away or the broadcast you are doing 20 miles away or up 10 blocks away. Uh, so that's what I'm referring to as remote. Um, today, what I will be talking about a little bit about is, because I do like to try to keep my presentations a little unbiased, I do work for a company that I'll mention up here, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about software codecs, hardware codecs, what's the difference, why would you choose one over the other, and then I'll get into a little bit of technology advancements about why you should look at some of these things in the modern world. Um, and some things that you can implement, whether you already have those hardware capabilities or software capabilities, you might want to think about implementing some of these things. And then last but not least, what I always like to try to do whenever I talk about codecs is I always try to give everybody a few extra troubleshooting techniques that you can work with. Um, so let's begin. Software. That's what I'm going to start with. Even though I'm a hardware company, let's dive in. Uh, software packages, you have several options out there in the world. Uh, to give you a few examples, you have a company that makes a product called Lucy, another company that makes IPDTL, that's web browser based, another one called CleanFeed, Skype, uh, you have Skype TX that's kind of fading away, Skype for businesses as well, but you have basic Skype still. Then you have Tyline's own app called Report It, a Comrex app called FieldTap, these are all software based codecs. So why should you look at software? Well. First off, things to note. It's cheaper. Software is always going to be cheaper. It's less expensive. But there is typically a monthly or annual fee associated with it. Something else to consider, technical support. Might be limited depending on the company you're working with. If you go with your own solution open source route, let's say like VLC, the support's all on you. There is no phone number to call and they say, hey, why isn't this working? So that's something else about software to keep in mind. You're at the mercy of your own operating system. Windows 10, I take it a lot of you are probably all running Windows 10. Do you like the Windows 10 update? Because me personally, I don't. It likes to ruin a lot of things out there. So you're at the mercy of your operating system, whether it's updates, CPU tasks, because they are not dedicated machines for a specific purpose. You might have some background tasks that can take higher priority. Virus protection is another thing you have to think about. Virus scan starts in the background. Typically, Windows Defender will take up a lot of CPU resources that you need for your audio stream. Power redundancy, that's based on the hardware you put it in. If you want that power redundancy, you have to plan accordingly for it when you go with software solutions. Network redundancy, same thing. Some of those applications may not even support multiple networks. Some of them might. But you might have to build everything from the in and out yourself. An auto reconnect, it's a basic hardware function. Some software products don't even offer it. You may have to implement it yourself. Anybody here know how to program? I hope so, because if you go the software route, you may have to do some programming of your own. Hardware wise, these are the big companies in the world that do remote products or audio codecs. I did leave out a few because there's a ton to mention. Uh, Tyline, AEQ, Comrex, Telos, and Digigram. Uh, we all make the same thing. We all try to accomplish the exact same thing, giving you high reliability audio and a dedicated hardware unit. So why hardware? Well, you have a lot of things implemented already. Companies like Tyline and Comrex, we've gone out of our way to implement 
technologies like forward error correction. That's nothing new, but it's there. Some software stuff may not offer that. Packet level duplication. That's all on the operating system layer. Companies, again, in the manufacturing world, uh, we, have, we have taken the time to implement that into our own operating system natively. That's less legwork for you guys in the long run. I'll dive into duplication here in a minute. Network bonding, same thing. You can do that on a Windows machine, but you have to set it all up yourself. Not that big of a deal for some of us who know how to do it. For the ones who don't, well, there might be an easier solution in the hardware realm. Transportation failover, that's another one. Some audio codecs, software-wise or hardware-wise, may give you that option to fail over from one network to the next. Sometimes you might have to write that all yourself to make that happen. And adaptive buffering. Some of the open source software out there, adaptive buffers, that's all based on you. You have to write it yourself and make sure it all works properly yourself. There are some that have it implemented, like TRX, it's a Linux package. Um, and a lot of applications in the world actually utilize TRX to, because of all the features that they've implemented already. So here's some of the examples of modern stuff in the world to give you two. Uh, one's in the US, one's actually in France. Um, new modern hardware stuff out in the world to kind of give you an idea of what they're doing. The one on the left, the Comrex units using two LTE networks plus an ethernet port as well to make its connectivity live from a conference similar to this. The other one is on the right, that's a, of a tie line via. That's actually in the middle of the mountain range in France. During the tour of France, they're using a satellite connection. Both of them are using redundant streams back to the studio. So some additional things that hardware codecs and some people do overlook. When compared to software-wise, you're focused on, everything's focused around your CPU. And the hardware-wise, Companies like Tyline and Comrex, we've bothered to implement a CPU, yes, for the main tasks, but we also have DSP architecture. What does that allow us to do? We can offload a ton of stuff onto that. Audio encoding, when it comes to a software codec, you have to focus on your CPU. All of that happens on the CPU. Resources get pretty high. If anything like virus scan happens, it takes away from your encoding time. Your latencies might go up or you might just start losing packets left and right. Where with a DSP-based solution, like a hardware unit, all that encoding is offset onto that DSP. So the CPU can do its own thing by running the user interface, web service maybe, to make sure you have remote access, or all the little other bells and whistles like redundancies. Where DSPs, again, we offload everything to that, for the most part. And when it comes to audio processing, signal processing, or even just simple routing, for instance. All of that's done through an offset architecture. Audio input cards, well, software-wise, you're based on the audio input of your laptop or your PC that you build. You can have a $10 sound card. You can have a $5,000 sound card. It's up to you at that point. How much money do you want to invest into a remote solution? Mixer capabilities. Show me a laptop that has a slide fader on it, please, because I have yet to find one. So in terms of mixings, you can do virtual mixing. You can plug in a sideboard to it and get all your external mixes that way, but now that's more equipment for your talents to actually carry in the field. Today in the modern world, why not try to do everything in one box? Make it easy for your talent out in the field. And then technical support is always supported by the manufacturer. That way you have a finger to point. If it's made by man, whether it's a laptop or a hardware codec, you can point a finger at somebody at some point. Now, do you want to point the finger at Windows and Microsoft? Or would you rather point the finger at a company like Tyline and say, help me fix this? Who are you going to get support out of? That's the, something else to consider. So, oh, sorry. Here's some older examples to give you guys an idea. These are how clunky remotes have been in the past. And they have been even clunkier. I've seen more setups, more advanced setups out there, and more boxes in the field. But today, I'm starting to see less and less, which is a good thing. But why am I doing this topic? It's because I still get calls about, hey, I'm still carrying out my mic processor out there, a side mixer, a couple of headsets, a case, and then the codec, maybe something else to add into the bells and whistles, because the talent wants it. 
Well, today, if you look and do the proper investigating, you'll find that a lot of companies in the codec realm, we've already merged all of those products, if not, if not all of them, into a single platform. Easier to use, less equipment, and you still have that remote capability where you can control everything if need be. So, hardware solutions and software. You'll probably hear that I am still a little biased to hardware. I'm a hardware manufacturer, but I don't, by any means, bash on software. I'm a software believer. I do like software myself. It's great, especially open source. But there's a time and a place for each of them. What I like to call is a primary and a backup solution. Every radio station should have one, whether it's your STL site or a remote just happening down the road. You should have plan. Plan ahead, plan for a backup. In my case, what I always like to say is your hardware solutions should always be your primary solutions. They are going to give you all the internet connectivity you need, all the mixing capability you need, maybe mic processing as well, heck, maybe even a field recorder all built into one little platform. You can get a lot accomplished with that. But again, it goes back to the great saying of if it's made by man, it will fail at one point in time. So you got to plan for that. That's where software comes into play. Every remote I've ever been out onto, there's always a laptop. Throw some sort of software on there, whether it's Lucy, IPDTL, a WebRTC stream. Um, and real quick, for those who don't know, WebRT stream or WebRTC, it's a new protocol allowing you to do browser communication. So all you need is Firefox, Mozilla, um, sorry, Mozilla, Firefox, Google Chrome, or Opera. Um, all of those browsers all support browser-to-browser -browser communication or browser-to-hardware communication. But software is a secondary solution because, again, it can fail. Think of this. If you're doing a live broadcast at a town hall meeting and there's a little insert of voice track that you really want to capture, would you have it all go through a software codec that could potentially make you lose that sound bite that you really want? Or would you rather go for a dedicated hardware solution that is designed to operate in those conditions, 365, and to maintain that audio quality from A to B? It's a matter of you having that sound bite or not having it at the end of the day. So that's where primary and backup solutions come into play. So modern features. These are the features that every single company I've talked about today has implemented these to some extent. But at Tyline, I handle a lot of support still, too. I still get calls daily about, how do I make my remotes more reliable? It's a modern world. It's the 21st century. We're past the ISDN days. How can we get a more reliable remote like it was in, during the ISDN era? Well, these five points will help you get there. Knowing a little bit about them can help improve a lot. Forward error correction being one of them, quality of service, Packet replication, network diversity, and time diversity. Some of these things may be new to you guys. Some of them you may already know about them, or you might know of them through different names, depending on the company that implements them. Forward error correction, what is that? Well, it's an act of embedding data in a secondary stream that we take your audio frame, we make a digital analysis of it through an algorithm, that we have a bunch of zeros and ones to help us repair that data if it is lost. It's not foolproof by any means. But on an LTE connection, if you're losing 10% of your data, this can potentially help fix all of that right then and there. Some manufacturers have implemented it fully across their entire platform, whether it's software-wise or hardware-wise. Some of them have limited support with this. Some don't even offer FEC, period. That's another name for it, too, just in case you don't know, FEC. Quality of service. This one's a little bit more in depth, but I'm not going to go too deep into it because we can start decrypting packets if we really want to. Quality of service. It follows an Internet Engineering Task Force uh, standard, which is the RFC 2474. And what this does is it prioritizes data traffic something to get familiar with. Some of you may already know about it, some of you may not. Uh, the ones that don't, I would recommend that you do at least, if you take away anything from it, take away quality of service and what you can implement with it. It is something that is limited to an IPv4 network, first off and foremost. 
IPv6, it can work over natively over the public internet. IPv4, it only works over private networks, unless you have a specialized line from your carrier. But what this does is it can help prioritize all of your data traffic, whether it's voice traffic, email traffic, Facebook traffic, or audio streaming. Knowing a little bit about this can go a long ways. And to give you an idea, there's two mechanisms in it. You have your types of services and your class-based mechanisms. What that does is it's just a simple number that goes into a field in your product or your solution. Almost everybody offers it, whether it's on the operating system level or on the actual physical hardware interface that allows us to set that priority level in the network. Routers will see this packet or this bit and they'll plan accordingly. So different classes that you might see in quality of service. Best effort, it does what it says it does. It tries its best to get from A to B. That's about it. That's all it does, uh, which is also known as default forwarding. You have another one called expedited forwarding, which can help uh, ensure low delay, low loss, getting packets from A to B. That sounds pretty reasonable for voice traffic or audio traffic. Assured forwarding. You might have longer delays, but you also have guaranteed traffic. Also sounds pretty good for audio traffic, specifically on STLs. If you control both sites, A to B, if it's a private IP LAN link, set that up. Set up an assured forward quality of service stream. That way you always get your data from A to B, and now you can piggyback other nodes or other clients on top of that internet stream and not worry about bandwidth. Uh, class selectors, that could, it's a simpler version of uh, differentiated services of quality of service. And to give you guys an idea, here's a little chart that explains the hierarchy of it, if you will. You start at the top with your best effort, then you have a scavenger layer, a bulk data layer, followed by your network management, transmission da data, et cetera. Down here, you'll see, uh, I don't know if you can see the, oh, you can see the mouse. Uh, your DSCP, that's your, the main numbers you should focus on with quality of service. And the numbers down below represent the level that they are placed at. Typically, hardware manufacturers, I can speak for Tyline and Comrex, just because I have a lot of experience with Comrex. Uh, we always set ours right here at level 32, which is right between streaming video and interactive video. Why? Because we know it's going to give you a good connection back to the studio. It's going to give you an expedited service that gives you low delay, plus it also gives you a little bit more assurances on getting the data from A to B. So you can set that anywhere you want. If you want it down here at the voice level to get guaranteed signal, go for it. Delay-wise, though, it might be a little bit higher. Packet replication. This is a newer one. Uh, in terms of it's new to broadcast. It's been in the broadcast industry for about two to three years. Some of you may know it as Tyline Smart Stream Plus, or maybe uh, WorldCast SureStream, Comrex Crosslock. You may have heard some of these fancy marketing names. At the end of the day, they all do this, packet replication, or network bonding, or it's a whole suite of features, per se. Packet replication is one of those features, though. It's nothing new to the world of networking, though. Cisco designed this technique back in the 90s to operate between two switches. The idea is you set up two ports or a single port that duplicates the data. So we duplicate every single audio frame that's leaving, in this case in the world of broadcast, duplicate everything, and we send it again. Now, you can implement this one of multiple ways. Here, just native packet replication, it happens all over one network. It gives you 100% forward error correction is what I like to say. It's forward error correction, but now bit for bit is replicated. This can help repair audio loss, integrity back from the studio or to the field. Um, some companies have implemented this into field hardware as well as software, while others have just maintained this for their studio products, for studio to studio operation or studio to transmitter link operation. So why should you use it? Because it can help. At the end of the day, it can indeed help you have a more reliable broadcast, whether that's, again, to your tower site or from the field. Now, something on top of packet replication is network diversity. 
can't have network diversity without packet replication. You have to have them both. What does this do? It takes that packet stream, that secondary stream, and we simply duplicate it and send it over a different network at this point. Now this is where the real redundancies really come into play. With something like this, if you have an AT&T and a Verizon connection out in the field, and let's say a Comcast and an AT&T hard line at the studio, we can stream data over all those networks simultaneously. What does this allow us to do? Well, at the same point in time, what's the chances of the same audio frame being lost over two of those networks? The exact same time. It's very slim. So therefore, we have more, we have more assurances in place. That way the decoder can receive all that data, even the missing data, and we can try to repair it as best as we can. Um, this is more uh, effective than forward air correction. And it gives that uh, remote a, uh, it gives it a more seamless airtime, where that way you don't have dead air, missing frames, et cetera, or that digital jerpiness that uh, some of you might be familiar with with lost data on an STL link. So again, why would you implement this? Same thing as packet replication. It's the assurances. It's free technology. All the companies I've ever worked with, for the most part, all offer this at no additional charge these days, and you get it built right into the operating system. If you go the software route, you may have to do a little tweaking yourself. You may have to have the proper network cards in place. Typically, server-grade ones are best, instead of going after just the consumer $10 NIC card down from your local Best Buy. Um, but on top of network diversity, there's one other one. Some companies have implemented this, some haven't. It's called time diversity, or time network delay. What does this do? Well, it takes that same packet replication, takes that secondary stream at the encoder side, and they offset it. They offset it by, let's say, half a second. What does that do? Again, same thing. It comes down to insurances. If you take that same idea of two packets being lost over two different networks, at the exact same time, it's very slim. Now take that second stream, offset it by half a second. Who's to say that? It's, it's almost impossible at that point, in my argument. It's, like, it's not likely, but it is unheard of that you would lose the exact same audio frame at two different points in time. So now we can have a more assured STL link or remote site. One of the downfalls of time diversity, and this is why actually I'm speaking about this, but Tyline, we do not implement this. Why? Because it adds delay. It adds a lot of delay. Um, where if you want something low latency, time diversity might not be for you. But if you don't care about delay from A to B, like your STL link potentially, go for it. Add more delay to it at each end, and then that way you can have what's called time diversity. Some companies like WorldCast, for instance, uh, and GatesAir, they have both implemented these features to give you that more rock solid STL. As you can see, they focus more on STLs where others focus on low latency remote stuff. That's the difference. So some troubleshooting tools. Excuse me. Um, in the world of troubleshooting and audio codecs, there are three, th three key things to look at. Throughput, whether or not your network's even alive, or last but not least, what's actually going on with your network. These three tools can actually help you out quite a bit. There are a few others. Uh, to give you those others real quick would be like a ping test. Don't call up a codec manufacturer or software developer and say, hey, I got 20 milliseconds of ping. Why is my encode time at 500 milliseconds? A ping to us doesn't mean anything. It just tells us if something's alive. It's good to note if it's alive and working, but at the end of the day, it's not going to tell you much. Trace routes. Same thing. That's not listed on here, but again, it can give us an idea of how your data is flowing and if there are any big buffers that we should worry about. But to these software tools, these are all third party software tools. None of them are native unless you go to Linux, um, but it's good to note. One of them is a protocol that I'll kind of touch on. Same with uh, program Wireshark that I'll kind of touch on. iPerf. Everybody uses this every day. You may not know it, but you use it, I guarantee it. How many of you do a speed test at least once a week, give or take? I would imagine there's a handful of you out there. That's iPerf. That's what iPerf is. For instance, speedtest.net, their backend on their servers is a program called iPerf. 
It's made by a French uh, developer, and it's a very powerful tool. Wireshark, great for debugging. Uh, I heard somebody once tell me that they believe that Wireshark is the new audio oscilloscope for the network. You gotta learn it eventually. Well, you might as well dive into it now. It is very in depth. I will not go that in depth into it because we could be in here for hours, guaranteed. I mean, colleges teach courses just on Wireshark. Last but not least is the simple network management tool. Uh, that's a protocol in itself, very in depth, but it's great for monitoring, maintaining, and getting statistical data. But iPerf, let's start there. It's a network throughput tool. It's very straightforward. It is open source software. And I'm a big believer in it. Um, what does this tool allow you to do? Again, it measures the throughput between two server locations. Those servers are referred to as your own laptop. I'm not referring to like an Amazon web service. The idea with audio codecs, when you call up Tyline, one of the things we will tell you is, have you tried this? Why, because you can, for instance, your STL site. If you have a PC out at your STL, install this two megabit program, install it at the studio. Now you can do an actual speed throughput test between your tower and your studio site. Beforehand, you might just refer to speedtest.net and say, oh, hey, my tower site got, has 100 megs, my studio has 100 megs. You gotta have a 100 meg pipeline between the two, right? Not always. Depends on if they're two different carriers. If they're two different carriers, for instance, they have to have a handoff somewhere. That handoff could be limited to 10 megs, or it could have a huge 100 gigabit fiber line between the two. Depends on that telco. But doing your own speed test between your own two locations will give you that exact throughput and that capabilities that you have. It's very important to know that. Something else iPerf can actually offer you is that, oh, sorry. Well, real quick, just so you do know, iPerf, it is command line. If you're not familiar with command line, there is a GUI you can download. I've never used it. Command line, though, is very, very simple in this. But here's an example. This is what I wanted to show you guys. So here, this is a UDP throughput test, and what you can do is you can measure at any number. Here I set it up for 512 kilobits to just do a basic test, but the nice thing is with this test is I have my jitter. I can actually see the time it took from my laptop to my server and see that exact time. I can take that jitter, now I can apply it to my codec. I can make sure I have enough latency built into my audio codec whether, again, it's hardware or software-wise, to make sure that I have a good rock-solid connection. I can also make sure that the throughput between the two sites is enough and adequate enough for the bit rate I choose. Right there, you'll see, well, what if I choose 128 kilobit connection? Well, I have, what, 62 kilobytes? It's plenty. I have enough. When you do the bit-to-byte conversion, it's plenty. Well, now I know that. I can make sure I have that. Well. Let's say if I try to run a PCM connection through that link. <laughs> it's 1.5 megabits. Uh, good luck with that one there. Because again, knowing how to set it up in advance, having the proper measurement tools will help you set it up properly the first time. Hopefully you never have to touch it again. Now this might be a little harder for remote sites out in the world if you go down 10 blocks down the road. But if you're using that same LTE connection or that same hardline internet connection and you had this server already set up at your studio, it can help save a little bit of time in the long run so that way you can plan accordingly. Here's another example of uh, the iPerf test. This one's fully throttled um, and this is between literally my laptop and my server, straight connection. It's good to note that hardware because hardware is a limitation in iPerf. You might have a 10 gigabit network card in your server, but that server card might only actually support six and a half gigabits throughput. You need to know those things so that way, you, again, you can set up the test properly. Wireshark, what exactly is it? As I said, it's the new oscilloscope for networks. If you need to troubleshoot audio, whether it's an Axia system or a tie line system or even a Wheatnet system, or AES-67, Wireshark is gonna be a very important tool to know and have. There are hundreds of books. I even have a good book that I can recommend to you guys. 
but again, at the end of the day, it's coming down to decrypting a packet, zeros and ones or in hex. Um, but what this allows you to do is with Wireshark, it can help you manage that data and make it more readable. So you, now you can actually see exactly what's going on, see if the data even arrives, or if it arrives corrupted. It's important to see this data ahead of time because if it's being corrupted on your network, then you have a problem with your network and your remotes will not work well. Or again, if you go back to AES 67 or Livewire or Wheatstone, same thing there. You need specialized uh, networking equipment and it has to be set up properly. And having Wireshark in your arsenal might be a good tool to know. Uh, Wireshark is a, it is universal. It's primarily installed out of the box with Linux machines specifically aimed towards IT administrators. Um, but it can be installed on Windows and Mac. They do have a command line option if you are a command line person like myself. Uh, they do also have a GUI toolkit as well that comes native. Last but not least is simple network management. So the management tools out there are, you're either going to find manufacturer installed ones, ones that are actually embedded in your codec solutions, your networking equipment, etc. Or you can take all of that data from those devices and centrally manage it. Companies like Burke and Avacom, for instance, are two broadcast companies that have focused on SNMP traps and management. And I do recommend that you look at those devices for not just remote control, but gathering that data. Again, knowing about it in advance is much better than getting a call at 2 a.m. from your general manager. Would you rather be notified at 30 minutes beforehand and you call them, or would you rather get the call yourself from them saying something happened? Knowing is power. With SNMP, something else to note is that it is a very in-depth protocol. You have what's called set traps and informs. There are a lot of other types of message handlings with SNMP, but they can all be very valuable. Windows, for instance, offers an SNMP client built into it. It does have to be enabled and set up in advance. Mac, I can't speak for Mac, unfortunately. I'm not a Mac user at all. Linux, though, Linux is very easy to set up as well. When you get into dedicated hardware, whether it's your transmitter or your codec, for the most part these days all broadcast companies offer an SNMP client. That can again report that data back to you and having that statistical data will help you plan for a better remote or a better STL connection in the future. So to review, very short, very straightforward. Wanted to touch base on the hardware and software solutions of today kind of give you an idea of the pros and cons according from my perspective and what I've seen over the past 10 years. Understanding a little bit about uh, new technologies and new feature sets that have been Im implemented. And lastly, of course, just like I said, I always like to leave people with a little bit of troubleshooting info. Thank you guys for your time. Do I have any questions today or no? Very straightforward. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I can speak for Tyline on that one, and yes, we do. Uh, we actually give you three independent mic processors in uh, our new platform product. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. You're all going to laugh at me. <laughs> I guarantee it. Dead serious. <laughs> Dead serious. Um, I have, I was recommended by, uh, to actually read that book by a Canadian broadcaster. Read it once. He, rec he sent me a few other links as well to go and look at, and I can do the same thing for you. Um, but Wireshark for Dummies, it's a thick one, but it's a good read. It actually really is. It just dives straight into it about this is what you're getting into. I can give you a book that's very detailed about packets and how to read the packets, or you might want to start at the higher end level and start there and go down from there. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I know you mentioned that Tyline is structured. Uh, so Tyline with time diversity, down the road we might explore it a little bit. Our big belief is always low latency audio. And with time diversity, you kind of take that away from there. Um, so that's, all, that's actually the, 
another reason why we don't do software as well is because of encode times and low latency. We want to maintain that. So maybe down the road you might see it in our STL platform products, uh, but you'll probably never see that in our remote products. Yes. Uh, yes and no. Uh, not natively as your traditional intercom system. Um, some stations have implemented some of our products as an intercom um, or just even a hardware codec in general as an intercom system. Um, but it depends on what you're willing to sacrifice out of that intercom. Um, if you're going to be around later on, I'm at the Broadcasters General Store booth and we can have a more in-depth conversation. I can show you some of the intercoms that they have on there, on the booth, and I can also give you a more rundown of how other stations have used our products in the past with our mobile app. Any other questions? No? I think we're good then. Thank you guys so much for your time and allowing me to speak, and uh, if you do have more questions, as I said, I'm at the BGS booth today. Thank you guys.